Um, so first off, I wanted to say we saw the movie yesterday. Oh, good. And we good. absolutely good. loved it. Oh, good. Loved it. And so we were glad. speaking to Allison before. And yeah. She wanted to uh, ask us and be sure that Potterheads are going to love it. You know, the, like diehard Harry Potter fans. And I wanted oh. to let you know that we think that they will. Oh, good. Okay. That's Very much. Cool. That's so exciting. just putting that out there, you know, ease whatever fears you may have. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, and what? I forgot what my first question was. Oh, um, yes. I don't think that this is it, but we'll, we'll go here anyway. So, um, this one, yes. Fantasy Beast, set in 1926, yeah. New York. Yeah. And so you, obviously, you worked on the last four yeah. Potter films, which were yes. set in the UK. Yes. So, when you found out this was going to be in America, in New York, yeah. how, did you approach those two worlds any differently? And, because obviously they're very different, and mm. did you have any conversations with Joe mm. about how not only the time periods are different, but you know, the cultures and how they approach magic and sure. how they practice it, so to say? Yes. Um, I mean, first of all, the big shift to make this really different to Potter was just shifting that setting. I think it's a really inspired, bold move on Joe's part because it completely resets the whole thing in many ways. And 1926, New York, completely new set of characters. And this wonderful combination of going somewhere that feels weirdly familiar, i.e. the universe, the world that she's created, but a new place completely. And, um, and the inspiration, that we didn't have many conversations about the time period. Um, I looked at lots of photographs of the period here in New York and that was an inspiration. And really her script is the inspiration, you know, the tone, the vibe of it. And so you're realizing, expressing what's on the page effectively and interpreting it and putting it up on the screen. Um, I found it really interesting that she chose this period because it sort of have echoes, has echoes of where we are now. In a weird way, you know, great disparities between the rich and poor, um, and sort of the right, sort of there were all sorts of reasons that it just felt sort of almost prophetic that she she picked that period. Um, and in terms of me approaching it as I approached the Potters, um, you know, it just felt like a, a new opportunity. And, and I was able, as a director, Chris Columbus did a brilliant job casting the first two quarters. You know, he, he set that world up in a terrific way. Um, and I was jealous because he'd done that. And I got to join it halfway in. And what a brilliant world he'd set up. Now it was my opportunity to define things slightly in terms of the cast and a sense of place and, and the magical world in America. So that this was my opportunity to set this part of the story up and that for me was very exciting. When I did ask Joe about magic in America there were a couple of questions I asked and as ever with Joe what's remarkable is you ask one question and you get pages and pages of answer. <laughs> you know she's amazing so it, um, she literally sent overnight once like a 15 page breakdown of the history of magic in America mm. in an, a single email and it was I only asked about where was Madame Pickery from originally. <laughs> it was something. Like, Where's Mad? Where, you know, I was casting Madame Pickery, and it was. Oh, where is she from? In America? What was in? You know, which which state? And like overnight, this email came back with 15 pages about the history of magic in America, and it was like, wow, okay. Um, but it was uh, it was pretty evident from that first draft where Joe was keen to take everything, and so. The majority of conversations about the, the kind of texture of the world and the structure of the world I would have with Stuart Craig, my lovely production designer. You mentioned that you got to kind of start fresh, so to say, mm. with Fantastic Beasts since you joined Potter in the middle. Yes. It must be really wonderful for you to be able to have almost total creative freedom, in a way. It must be, it must be freeing. It is, and, and um, I mean, Potter was a great... For me, as, as, a, as a filmmaker who was coming into a huge movie-making um, process, I couldn't have had a better, nicer, safer introduction to that than Potter. 
because the whole infrastructure of making those movies had already been set up by Chris, by Alfonso, by Mike, you know, so I, I entered this world and I had freedom in it, you know, I was able to cast new characters and I was able to take the world darker and a little bit more intense, but fundamentally, the t you know, so much had already been set up. The freedom of casting beasts, and there was no pressure from anybody mm -hmm. to cast movie stars, you know, there was no pressure to, there was no pressure to say, you've got to make this person or that person. It was a completely open canvas, and that was a great, you know, and that's how it always worked in television. Before I made Potter, you go out into the world and you find the best actor for the role. You get the, the actor who interprets that character in the most interesting way and brings that character alive in the most dynamic way. And I was doing that again on this huge movie and there was zero pressure to cast stars. So it was, it was very liberating and it was great fun. And it was lovely to be there at the very beginning. <laughs> that makes me so happy to hear that there was uh, no pressure yeah. to cast the stars and stuff mm. that because I feel like some people, some people in the fandom are are worried about it going that way. So I'm I'm really glad to hear that that was not oh, the case. That's <laughs> cool. There's a wonderful I think because the movies originally the Potters were so successful. There's a great trust in Joe. There's a great trust in David and I, um, and the studio are very supportive. Mm. On the whole, um, they're very supportive and they're very, they want it to be as good as it can be and um, yeah, so the, we get, we get sort of, we get a lot of freedom actually. Um, so th the story, the first one, our main, in, uh, main protagonist is Newt. Yes. And you know, by the end of the movie, we, we see Grindelwald and we kind of, are suspecting that that is where the five movies are going to go. It's going mm. to follow his story a little bit and his yeah. rise to power and eventually get to the duel with Dumbledore in 1945. And a lot of the fandom seems to be a little bit worried that yes. Newt's story is going to end up being overshadowed. Mm. And I can say that personally, I haven't connected with a character like as much as I did with Newt in a really long time. Interesting. And yeah, I don't want to lose his story. So I wanted to ask you about that and why, why is it Newt and how is, I know you don't know the total answer to this, but how much is Grindelwald going to kind of overshadow that? Is he going to be kind of like a small part of the story and it's mostly new or, I mean, again, I know you don't know how much you know, but. Well, I can tell you just for the second movie, um, Grindelwald is much more of a feature, but he does not overshadow Newt. Um, and he's, you know, he's an antagonist, and he's compelling, and he's seductive, and uh, he's much more present in the movie. But it's Newt's, it's Newt's story going forward. And I, I, I think it's fabulous that you responded to Newt in that way. And Joe says constantly to us, to Steve and I, um, Newt was the reason she wanted to start these new chapters. There was something about new that stuck in our head. And, and why is he compelling? I think he's um, something really, you know, he's, a, he's awkward, he's a bit knotty, he's quite British. Um, he's his own man, he's a real individual. Um, he's desperately, he's not able to connect always. Um, and he's passionate, he's a passionate character. He's passionate about these beasts he protects and he nurtures, and he's not always understood. Um, and he's got an amazing skill set that we haven't fully seen yet, mm. you know, because he's amazingly good at tracking these beasts, at looking after these beasts. You know, he's a vet, he's a hunter, he's, you know, he's got, um, and by a hunter, I mean he's just good at tracking. And mm -hmm. So there's, an ama there's a whole array of qualities and skills that we haven't yet seen Newt perform by virtue of what he does. Um, so, I don't think there's any danger of Newt being overshadowed, but at the same time as the world expands and the story expands, inevitably Dumbledore is going to sort of, you know, Dumbledore appears in the second movie and, you know, there will be more of Grindelwald and there will be more of Dumbledore. And you probably can't say this, is there any place that we will recognize in movie two or are we going back to any place that we have been before? 
We are, I mean, we're going back to the Ministry of Magic. Okay. So that features. Um, Hogwarts has been popped in a couple of times and popped out. <laughs> so the script's evolving, so it's really hard right now to kind of, um, to sort of be specific. But, um, you know, there are elements of, the, yeah, there are elements that appear from, that will be familiar. Mm 